This is Sunday Night Worship Service here at the Pine Little Pentecost Union Church. Part number seven of What We Believe. Senior Pastor Farrell Hardison bringing the message tonight on this February the 26th, 2023. We'll start our service now in about two minutes. Hey everybody, how y'all doing? Good to see y'all on this Sunday night. And um, I always talked about the people that loved the church come on Sunday morning. And the people that love one another, or some, I had some little saying, come on Sunday night. And the ones who love Jesus come on Wednesday night. <laughs> and uh, just picking on folks. But it's so good to see everybody. Thank y'all for coming. Getting out on a Sunday evening. And... Um, Getting here, uh, I'd just like to make a little proclamation right here if I can. <clears throat> My grandson's been with us for four days and Papa is tired. I just <laughs> want y'all to know, Papa's tired. <laughs> and uh, Papa don't get to just plop down anytime he wants to, but Liam goes to sleep anywhere, anytime he wants to. But he, he um, had him a good time at church today. I told Somebody, I was going to go home and tell people I saw folks running the aisles at our church today. He put Buddy's hat on and was running everywhere. And Y'all are so sweet to him and loving toward him. I appreciate that. And uh, he went home this afternoon. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all didn't hear that, did you? Did y'all hear me say that? Um, what was the saying I heard of? Granddaddy say one time, he said he loved the lights at Christmas time and the family coming. And he said he loved the lights on the Christmas tree and he loved their tail lights as they were driving off going back home. <laughs> but um, he, uh, he had him a good time while he was here. And of course, Millie's in hog heaven when he's anywhere around. <clears throat> so we're talking about our, our doctrine. Doctrine is very, very, very important. And um, we need to know what we believe and why we believe it. And Brother Mac, I've just jumped right off into the message here. But we do have some events coming up this week. I believe we're clear Monday and Tuesday, aren't we? And then Wednesday night after service, we got a quick deacons meeting for uh, any of you deacons that are here watching online. And it shouldn't be 30 minutes at the longest. Um, it looks like uh, that we have a couple more things to do, but uh, it looks like that um, Brother Brian Towton uh, will probably come and be our, um, our uh, student pastor or youth pastor. 
Um, he and his family are going on vacation the 1st of March, and I believe they are back on the 12th, which is a, a Sunday. And what we will do, if, if it fits the schedule, and I'm just kind of putting this out there, so Jenny, you're probably hearing it for the first time, Mac, some of y'all, but I'd love to have a, a welcome for him and Mary Catherine uh, on the 12th, that Sunday night, we'll just go into Fellowship Hall and have a welcome. And then let him share with us uh, his vision uh, for the students and that kind of thing. So it is pretty much a done deal. And uh, uh, he is, he's feeling the Lord's leading. And I uh, hope you all are feeling at peace about it. If you're not feeling at peace about it, I want you to call me. I want you to talk to me. If you've got questions, uh, anytime... We do anything like that, like add a staff member or something like that. I want your feelings. I want you to never feel like that it's none of my business. Yes, it is your business. And you can ask me any question you want to ask me. And I've known Brian for many, many years and uh, known his wife even, even longer. So I know them very, very well. And you're welcome to talk to me or ask me any question you want to. to. But right now, it does look like they'll be joining us maybe in uh, about two or three weeks here. And so we're excited about that. Those of you who are already working with our students, like Carolyn and Paul and others, he wants you a major part of the team. As a matter of fact, he wants you all to carry on your same role quite a bit. And uh, he'll, he'll just be there to assist you and lead you and... Um, he's not here to take over, he's here to lead. And that's how I felt when I came. I, I didn't come in to take over, didn't come really in to fix anything. Uh, just came in, felt like it was the Lord's will for me to be here, and we've seen God do some good things, haven't we? And uh, now we're excited about our Rangers starting this Wednesday night, and, and Miss Millie and, and Jamie are working on the girls' ministry. And uh, any of you women who want to be a part of that, maybe you've already said it or you've already signed up somewhere, I don't know. Um, but you are welcome, welcome to be a part of that. As a matter of fact, with the younger boys, there are roles for women in the younger part of the, of the uh, Royal Rangers. Uh, a woman can actually be a commander. And we had that at my previous church that I pastored. We had that there and had some ladies that were great blessings. We have some roles for women even in the Royal Rangers. And, it'll, and with the little girls, of course, it'll be just, just women ministering to them. But this is, um, let me just talk about it a little bit. <coughs> yes. Yes. Okay, okay. That is, a, that is a good question. Uh, let's think about that. Let's rethink that. We might do that the next Sunday. Uh, I guarantee if there's food there, Brian will come the next Sunday just as well as he comes on the 12th. So, so I'll work all that out with him. But we'll have a little welcome for them. And then, and then he wants to meet with our students on Sunday nights. He wants that to be the big gathering of the, of the students and uh, do some Bible study, certainly going to do some Bible study and all that, but, but to do other things. And, and uh, you know, when you're working with young people, uh, you, you have to do a mixture of things in that time that you're with them. Right, Amy? Isn't that right? Amy's like, he has pointed his finger at me. He's talking to me. And uh, uh, the, I, I met with the teenagers, actually, because I wanted them to be a part of this decision as well. And uh, they were very vocal about um, wanting to be a part of it. And they've all met Brian, and uh, they really like him, the ones I've heard from. And uh, so we're, we're looking forward to a, a wonderful boost uh, to our, not just our teenagers, but just our whole youth overall you all know that I uh, mentioned that when I came here, that that would be my focus when I came. And, um, and so that's what we're doing. And we had a good service this morning. And uh, uh, you won't, you won't, I won't do what I did this morning very many times, but I really did sense this morning. When I'm opening up a sermon, I'll give you all a little tip. If I walk down at the opening, I might, I'll just go about anywhere. So just hang in there with me. But today, I just I felt like it was really important to talk about that timeline for the end times, and I'm going to bring that chart to you next Sunday. 
And you'll have that. You can keep it in your home and just go through it. It gets to remind you of the events that will happen. The next thing, of course, is the rapture. And then that, that timeline that I'll give you also shows what's going to happen after the rapture and where that is on the timeline, the events that will, that will follow that. Because the Bible is very specific uh, about the years and the time after the rapture. Now, we don't know when the rapture is, but once the rapture happens, the times are set. Seven years tribulation, thousand year millennial reign, and then, of course, we go into eternity. And, and um, of course, thank the Lord, hallelujah, that's never ending. And that scripture that, uh, that we read this morning just blessed my heart. It kind of jumped off the page. I'd read it a bunch of times getting ready to preach this morning. But when it said... But when it said uh, You'll be with the Lord always. That just, uh, that just touched my heart deep this morning. What a great, great, wonderful thought, especially in this old world we live in today. Amen. To know that you're going to be with the Lord always one day. And uh, that's a great thought. So we'll, we'll just carry on with that on Sunday morning. Right now, I think I've got about three sermons that I want to preach in that series. But if I see it... Um, Connecting, or I begin to feel the Spirit deal with me, we might go two or three more sermons uh, and make sure we get that covered uh, in as much detail as possible. One thing me and Brother Mac will do is we will threaten you we're going to quit preaching, but then we just keep on. It's just good to us, isn't it, Brother Mac? It's just good to us. And uh, uh, that, that teaching he's done on the book of John, and, and uh, it's just so good, and, and uh, looking forward to him getting started in Acts this Wednesday. And uh, that's about all I can think of that we need to kind of talk about before I get into this lesson. Have we got anything else? Can y'all think of something else that uh, we need to remind everybody of this week? I've done good, didn't I? All right. So we're going to talk about the Word of God a little bit more. To tell you the truth, I could spend probably through the summer on this chapter of the book. And the book that we're looking at, you all know, I don't know if you have your book with you or not, <clears throat> but the book we're kind of using as a guide is The Beauty of the Balance by Dr. Terry Trammell. Dr. Terry Trammell is one of our ministers in our denomination. He is a brilliant man. A brilliant man, and you know that if you've tried to read this book at all. And this book really uh, is not as complicated as it sounds. There are terms in there that we don't use a lot in the church because they are really uh, heavy theological terms, but they're not really hard to understand. And there are many, many scripture references in here that I'm not going to give you because uh, we, that, that in and of itself would would make the lesson very, very long. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, and you can tell what I'm doing, I'm picking and, and uh, um, the highlights, the, the parts I want you to grasp. Um, you know, when I think about, when I think about uh, any sermon series that I do or any preaching series or any, any um, teaching series that I do, I ask myself, what do I want to accomplish what is my goal in going through this material? My goal in this is that you will have a ready answer on the basic things of doctrine. Now, the reason I say a ready answer on the basic things is because we can have a lot of different ideas about the detail things. And we can say, well, I kind of view it this way or I view it this way. What I want you to be able to do is when somebody says... So over there at that Pentecostal Holiness Church at Pine Level, what do you all believe about the Bible? Not what do you believe uh, in the Bible some particular place, but just how do you feel about the whole Bible in general? And I want you to be able to answer that, and I think you can. I I'm sure you can is to look at people and say, we believe the Bible is the Word of God. We believe the Bible is God's Word from the first word to the last word of the book. We believe it's God-breathed. We don't believe there's anything uh, before the Bible or anything that's going to come after the Bible to be added to it. The Bible's complete. That's one of the things I want to get in your mind tonight. And I think I said it, I believe the last time I spoke or, or talked two weeks ago, 
and um, I, I went over that with you. And so what we want to just talk about tonight is we talked about revelation a little bit. I think one of the last things I said was rather than merely dropping down list of propositional truths from the sky, the Lord chose selected human servants to, and in, uh, in the divine press, process of transmitting his word to us. So the, the, the uh, Farrell Hardison way of saying that is God cho chose people. God chose to give his word to us through people. And he could, have, uh, he could have, again, dropped it from the sky, I guess, or written it up in the sky. You know, God can do anything, but he gave his word to us through other people. And that's a wonderful study. And I would encourage you to take this book. I'll tell you what I did with my book. I learned to do this in Bible college. It's a paperback book, and if you, if you press it down real wide open, you can peel those pages right out. It's like uh, uh, post-it notes. They'll just come right out, and that's what I did to mine. And then since I'm the age I am and I've got the eyes I've got, I blew it up. I made it bigger so I could see it better and read it. And so what I'll do is I'll take this chapter. I've got chapter one in this folder right here. And I'm able to go through there and mark it up and write in it. And then I've still got my original pages from the book. And uh, then I could, I'll write question marks on the side for myself. Like, I don't know what that means or what does that mean? You might want to go, I'm going to run that by Pastor Farrell, who will probably have to run it by the guy who wrote the book. But I want to know about this and what does that mean? And, and I'll help you as much as I can. And if I don't have the answer, we'll find the answer. We'll talk to the author of the book and he'll tell us what his uh, thoughts were there. <clears throat> if you ever get a chance to hear him preach, he's an incredible preacher. And we have him speak at Falcon all the time. Again, Dr. Terry Trammell. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about inspiration. The inspiration of the scripture. Uh, his book says here, and I'm going to just pull out some highlights. Not only did God give his very word to chosen human vessels, the Holy Spirit also guided the process of the writing of their, their language unto the original parchments that made up the Holy Scriptures. Now, one of the places that uh, um, the word parchments is used, do you remember when um, uh, Paul and Barnabas chose Mark to come with them? On a mission trip. Do y'all remember that in the Bible? Barnabas and Paul. Paul. Now let's just back up a little bit. Barnabas was the man of God, the Christian, who when Paul got saved, I mean Paul had been a holy terror against the people of God. I mean, he's the one who held the coats while Stephen was stoned. And Paul himself, personally, the apostle Paul before he got saved, was responsible for the persecution and killing of many Christians. And he thought he was actually doing the Lord's work. He was a Pharisee. He thought he was doing the Lord's work. But then Paul, on the road to Damascus, got saved, had a genuine conversion experience. Well, now he's got to go back to that church where he has tortured their parents and, and killed their family members and go, Hey, y'all, I got saved. I'd like to join the church. And so in order for him to uh, get into the church and be accepted by the church, he needed somebody to vouch for him. And it was Barnabas who vouched for Paul. And then Barnabas and Paul began to go on mission trips together. And one, and one day came along where Barnabas said, Hey, Paul, I've met this young boy that's a Christian and he's got a special touch of God on his life. His name is Mark. And I want him to go with us on our next mission trip. Well, they took him on that mission trip. And somewhere along the way, I don't know what happened. Mark got a little bit uh, uh, homesick, you know. He missed his mama's biscuits. I don't know exactly what was going on. Maybe he had a little girlfriend and... And he missed her, but anyway, he, uh, he said, I don't want to go any further on this mission trip. I'm going to go on back home. I don't know, you know, maybe a little homesick or whatever. And he went on back home. So then when Barnabas and Paul finished the mission trip and went back home, 
Barnabas said, hey, Paul, uh, you know, I know Mark let us down and, and all of that, but he's young. He's trying to get going. Let's give him another chance. And Paul said, no. Paul said, no, sir. No more chances. That was it. He messed up. No more chances. So that's when Paul and Barnabas divided, not angry. Did you know Christians can have different opinions and actually go in different directions and still not hate each other? Did y'all know that? And not talk about each other and not criticize each other. Did you know as long as there are two people, there's going to be conflict in this world, even if both of them are saved? Amen. Y'all know that? And so, and so Barnabas and Paul had a disagreement. This was a major disagreement, but they didn't uh, disagree the way so many Christians disagree. Uh, really and handle a situation like they would handle it if they weren't Christians. Hold grudges and be angry and gossip and all that. They didn't do any of that. How, how many of you know who chose? Who did Paul choose then? So he had been with Barnabas. Barnabas says, I'm not going to go with you on the next one because I'm going to take Mark with me. And Paul chose Silas. Yes, Paul and Silas then began to go on the mission trips. And there's not anything really recorded of any major detail, but Barnabas took Mark, and they did mission trips. They did mission work. Well, um, when Paul ends up in prison, and Paul knows he's at the end of his life, he's in a Roman prison, he writes, send Mark unto me. I think this is so precious. Now, this was a young preacher boy that Paul had basically thrown up his hands and said, I'm not going to mess with him anymore. Well, evidently, Mark proved faithful, and Paul had heard about Mark's faithfulness, and Mark wrote a letter and said, I want, uh, Paul wrote a letter and said, I want Mark to come visit me. He said, I want him to bring me two things. I want him to bring my coat because I'm cold. And I want him to bring the parchments. I want him to bring the Bible. Now, of course, Paul didn't have the whole Bible at that time. Paul, he was too busy writing the Bible. He, could, he didn't have the whole Bible, but he had the Old Testament. And he said, I want you to bring me my parchments. And I just love that story. And, and you probably have heard it before. And I don't know. I may have told it before. I told Millie one of the wonderful things about getting old was you could look at a movie and then look at it again six months later because you couldn't remember any, any of it. So you, you really got your money's worth out of it. So I've probably told y'all stories before. And you go, here we go again. He's telling that same story again. And I may have told you that one. But you probably already knew it from your Bible study and, and being in classes. But it's one of the most touching stories to me. I remember the first time I heard it as a young Christian just thinking about, man, that, that's, a, that's a beautiful story in the Bible we don't hear much about. And that was Paul giving a young Christian who stumbled another chance, another chance. And, and the reason I even mention that story and tell that story is because it said the word parchments here. And so when Paul said, to have Mark bring me the parchments, if you didn't know that, if you hadn't studied to find out what that was, he was talking about what there was of the Bible at that time. Bring me my Bible and bring me my coat. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, he goes on here and he says the Holy Spirit, he said this definition of inspiration um, introduces students to the next phase of the process. Uh, such action illustrates the unique work of the Holy Spirit overseeing or superintending the writers so that their words expressed the exact thoughts God desired to convey. <clears throat> now one of the things Brother Mac taught us, if you've been coming on Wednesday night, is he taught us that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are telling the same story. They're telling the story of Jesus. So if the Holy Spirit is in charge, wouldn't the Holy Spirit have told them to write the exact same words? Well, you might think that right off, but here's the wonderful thing. God allowed the personalities of these writers and God allowed the, the um, perspective 
of these writers, which, which were different how they viewed him, who they were made them view the Lord differently. And uh, in their situations, they perceived uh, things of truth that maybe Matthew didn't perceive, Mark did, or maybe John didn't perceive, but Luke did. All of it's truth. All of it's truth. You say, well, you know, and I've had this argument. I've had this argument. I've had, I've had people try everything in the world on me, you know. Well, why didn't Mark tell that part of the story? Because God didn't intend for him to tell it. He intended for Matthew to give the detail on that story. And Mark might just mention a story in the Bible. And maybe there's three or four or five verses about it. And then you go over there and Matthew's telling the same story. And it's a half a chapter. Or it's a whole chapter. And you say, well, shouldn't those be the same? No. God inspired men and women, personalities, to write the word of God. True evangelicals, and that's who we are, are unequivocal in their belief in the inspiration of the scripture. There's a couple of words. If you've got your hand out, and I didn't bring any extra ones with me tonight, but if you've got your hand out, the word, I think it's on there. It might not be on there. You might want to write this one down. Verbal and plenary, verbal and plenary, inspiration. Those are two important theological words when you're studying doctrine because we believe the Pentecost Holiness Church, Pine Level Pentecostal Holiness Church, believes in the verbal plenary inspiration of the Scripture. Now, verbal means that we believe the Holy Spirit uh, inspired the writers and assured the accuracy of every word, every single word in the original manuscripts. Plenary inspiration extends uh, such accuracy to every part of the Bible. So the verbal inspiration deals with each word. The plenary inspiration pulls it all together, connects it all together, and says to us, this is all the Word of God. It's all the Word of God. Every bit of the Bible is the Word of God. And that's a little bit what I want to talk about tonight. And I'm not going to hold you here a long time. And uh, you be praying. I just said that out loud. God heard me. So y'all be praying. Pharaoh will remember what he said, that he's not going to hold us too long tonight. The specific inspiration contains magnified importance. The Apostle Paul was writing to Timothy I mean, Paul was always starting new churches. Let me just teach on that for just a minute. The gift of apostle, the gift of apostle, and I'm going to pick on some people here tonight, not, not y'all, but just some people in the church world. Do you ever, y'all ever go by a billboard and there's a picture of a man and his wife up there, a glamour shot, looks like a glamour shot, and it's, it's apostle somebody and his wife? Well, you can't just give yourself the title of apostle unless you start new churches. Apostles start new churches. Paul had a spiritual gift, and it was the gift of apostle. So what he would do is he would go to a town like Thessalonica, he started a church. He'd go to another town like Ephesians, start a church. He would raise up leaders. He would recruit leaders. He would train leaders. He would be with them for a little while, and he'd look at them and go, y'all got it? And they go, yeah, I think we got it. He said, well, I'm going to write you later or I'll come back by and check on you. But get that church going. Let's get as many people saved as we can. Then he'd go to another town, start another church. And that's what apostles do. You cannot name yourself apostle if you're not an apostle. That's just a little pet peeve of mine. Um, matter of fact, uh, something that really bugs the daylights out of me are titles. Titles. And uh, I'm so glad y'all don't call me reverend. Thank you so much. Because Millie, if she was here, we go, there are times he's not very reverend. I can tell you that. Uh, but, but people are so caught up in titles. And man, I, I know there's got to be a chain of command. And I know there's got to be a flow chart. And we got to know where the deacons are on that flow chart. And we've got to know where the leadership of the church is on that flow chart. And we've got to know where the members are on that flow chart. I know all that's important. But I'm going to tell you something. My name is Farrell. Now, you can call me pastor or you can call me anything you want to call me. But I'm telling you, if you really want me to come run and just call me Farrell. 
and I'll come run. I just am not about the titles. Um, uh, but uh, Paul is saying here, he's writing to Timothy. Paul, again, was an apostle. He started churches. Another thing Paul did, Paul was always recruiting volunteers, recruiting servants, which ought to make a little alarm go off in our head. If we are a healthy, growing church, we're going to be constantly recruiting, constantly recruiting. Now, y'all know that I gave a little illustration of it this morning when I walked over there and, and talked about going up to Eddie and tapping him on the shoulder and saying, Eddie, what are you good at, man? And he would tell me a couple things he's good at, and I'd say, well, you can help us with this, and you can help us with that. A healthy church has a constant flow of leaders coming into the church and people getting saved and then growing in the Lord and becoming leaders. And some people have different kinds of leadership skills. But one of the things this church will always need is leaders. We always need leaders. And, and um, uh, I don't agree with everything he says, but Andy Stanley said something one time that really got my attention. He said, if you don't know where you need to serve in the church, if you can't figure out where you need to volunteer and where you need to serve, he said, give your heart and hands to the place of greatest demand. Give your heart and your hands to the place of greatest demand. So let's say <coughs> that you get saved, but you don't have the Bible knowledge yet to be a teacher, but that's your gift. Your gift is being a teacher, but you don't have the Bible knowledge. Then go ahead and serve somewhere. Just serve under somebody. Just serve as an assistant. Let me, let me tell you, when God sees you willing to serve anywhere, then he will put you in that sweet spot where he wants you to be. I don't know if y'all remember me saying that at the leaders meeting over there that Saturday a few weeks ago. But that's very, very, very important. Um, if you come to me and you say, I just can't find a place to serve in the church, then I'm going to say to you, will you serve anywhere? Will you serve at the place of greatest demand right now? And don't ask me if I know what that is, because I will know. <laughs> and I will say, we need you here and here and here. And it might be some lowly job. It might not be a job that puts you on the stage. It might not be something that, that you really get to do what you're going to do later. But I want you to understand my point here. When God sees in you a willingness to serve where it's needed, then he's going to open up those other doors for you. Doesn't that make sense? Doesn't that make sense? I mean, why would God say, okay, well, you're special. So you don't have to wash feet because you're special, even though Jesus washed feet, didn't he? So we've got to be willing to wash feet. I mean, that's the worst job there was. The servant, when you, when you, if you had any uh, stature at all in the community, uh, when visitors came to see you, there were servants and there were basins of water at the table because they wore sandals and he, the, the servant would wash their feet before they came into the house. And so Jesus said, in order to show people what your heart needs to be, I'm going to do the lowliest job and I'm going to wash my disciples' feet because he wanted to be an example to them. So you serve where you're needed first, and then you just trust God, and he will put you in that spot he wants you to be in. I promise you he will. He'll do it every time. So here's what Paul said to Timothy. Paul is developing, mentoring Timothy, and near the end of his life and ministry, Paul says to Timothy, he says, um, I want you to get this, Paul, uh, Timothy. I want you to get it. It's in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. How much scripture? All scripture. All scripture. Everybody say it. All scripture is breathed out by God. And I'm not sure which... Um, um, I'm not sure which version or which paraphrase that Dr. Trammell's using here, but you can be sure he would not use it if it was not accurate. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. How much scripture is profitable for teaching? How much? 
All. All scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof. Amen. Amen. It'll reprove us for correction. Amen. Amen. We don't like that part. That part don't feel good, but we need that part, don't we? For reproof and correction and training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent. Ladies, that includes you. That means the human of God, the human of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Very, very important passage of scripture um, that you need to know in your understanding of doctrine and what we believe. So the inspiration of the Bible does not correspond to the modern usage of the term describing art or music or writings as inspiring the performer, composer, or reader. On the contrary, listen to this. The scriptural meaning of this word carries the idea of being God-breathed. The word of God, the Bible, sometimes we have it in a book form. You might have it in front of you right now in a pew rack. But whether it's on your phone, it's all the same. It's God breathed it out and God breathed it into us. And he goes on here to say that such a concept is consistent with other passages that emphasize the role of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit guided the human authors in writing the scripture. For example, the apostle Peter said, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. I'm sorry, 2 Peter 1.21. 2 Peter 1.21. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. It did not come from man. No man apart from God has ever come up with any scripture. He says, but men spoke from God. God is the source of the scripture as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the twin text here that I just read to you, 2 Peter 3, 16 and 17. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me slow down. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 and 2 Peter 1, 21. The all of Paul's passage and the no, no prophecy will be given by man alone from Peter's pen exclude the possibility of only parts of the Bible being inspired. So here's the point of what we're talking about. There are a lot of people in this world, I don't know if I would say more, but there are about as many people in the world who might say, well, I believe some of the Bible is inspired, but I don't believe all of the Bible is inspired. There are people who, who say, well, I think the story of Jonah being swallowed by a fish, you know, I'm sure that didn't really happen. That's probably just a little fable or a little story to tell to make a point. And y'all remember what I've said about that probably. I'm like the little boy. He said, I'd believe it if it said Jonah swallowed the whale. He said, if the Bible said it, I believe it. Amen. And so that's how we are. We believe whatever the word of God says is true, is true. Now we know, uh, we know that there are illustrations in the Bible and, and there are types in the Bible. And of course, uh, those aren't to be taken literally when it talks about a camel getting through the eye of a needle. Uh, that's an illustration talking about how hard it is for a wealthy person to live a Christian life. He's just talking about how difficult that is, and he gives that little illustration. And um, it goes on here, if only some parts of the scripture were inspired, and obvious, uh, the obvious problematic issue, and I think I said this last time I was teaching, would be who decides which parts are the Bible and which parts aren't the Bible. And uh, I got a feeling if, if, if that's what we came up with, uh, the, the Methodists would pick out the part of the Bible they like, and they'd teach that, and we'd pick out the part we like, and we'd teach what we teach, and it would just be a mess. What did Paul say? All, all Scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed. Now, you may have a question tonight about, well, what decided what goes in the Bible? 
What decided the canon of books that would go in the Bible? And I'm not going to go into detail on that because that's a lot of information. But he goes into some detail about that in this chapter. So I would encourage you, I would encourage you, just take this chapter and walk through it. Look up the scriptures and just learn, learn, learn. When you're doing that, <clears throat> this can be your devotional. It can be your Bible study. You can have a Bible study devotional uh, together. Um, that's, that's how it is for me. I don't have a separate devotional book. Now, I use devotional books, but I don't have a separate devotional book and say this is for devotional. And, and then I've got some other things I read that are for my Bible study. I get my devotional from my preparing to preach and my preparing sermons. And, and I've got some sermon series I'm working on right now that I'm going to preach while I'm here. And I'm putting together my stuff right now. But those, those studies serve to cause me to be personally more devoted to the Lord. So just have your time with the Lord. And and uh, just read a, a page, read a couple pages. As a matter of fact, in this chapter, he's got it divided up in different segments. So you can just take a different segment each day. And when you get through, when you go through this chapter and you look those scriptures up and you study, you're going to have a lot more knowledge than you had when you started. Now look, here's why that's important. The reason that's important is because the more you know about the truth of God's word, the stronger you are spiritually in this rotten world we live in. The reason a lot of Christians are defeated today is because they won't do the discipline of personal Bible study. Listen, God talked to us. You say, oh, I wish he'd talk to me. Study the word. If you will study the word, God will talk to you. God will speak to you. <clears throat> Brother Mac, when you're getting up your lesson, how many times have you felt the Lord speak to you? And you, I mean, you can just take your Bible. I do it sometimes and just turn it over and lay it face down because I know God just said something to me in that little word that I read right there. And, it, and then I'll have me a cry or I'll have me a time of rejoicing. And sometimes, uh, uh, you know, we just read, uh, Paul said, for reproof <laughs> and, re and rebuke and correction. And I'm telling you, I've been sitting in my old recliner a many a time and flip right around and turn that thing into an altar. Because the word I was studying to get ready to preach, I got convicted in my own heart about that. Has that happened to you before? Amen. And I mean, y'all who have to get up lessons and, and you're getting a lesson to teach. And, and I'm so impressed every time we have a gathering, somebody gives a devotion. I appreciate that. I appreciate the quality of those devotions. And I know you've studied and you know that when you do that, even though you're putting together something to share, you know that before you teach that Bible, it has taught, that Bible has taught you. Amen. So, so. You know, examine the Word and let the Word examine you. If you'll examine the Word and let the Word examine you, you'll grow. You'll grow. You'll get your roots down. Matter of fact, um, somebody asked me about a Bible, what Bible would I recommend. If you're, you know, just kind of getting started and, and matter of fact, I got to tell you, it doesn't matter where you are with the Lord. I just love this Bible. It's called the Life Application Bible. And the Life Application Bible, at the top of the Bible, has the scripture. And you can get that in the King James Version or the New King James, or you can get it in the New Living Translation. If you're a new Christian, you might want to get a modern translation like that because it reads so much easier. So you might want to get the Life Application Bible and get it in the King James or whatever you want it in. And then under those scriptures, right under it, is how to apply that to your life. How to apply what you just read out of the Bible to your everyday life. Now you can get this Bible, you can pay as much as you want to. If you want a leather bound, you know, really nice, it's going to cost you over $100. But if you just want a paperback one that's got the same thing in it, that one with the leather's got, you can get it for about $20. But I would recommend that book in your library. There is a devotional book I would recommend to you. It's Oswald Chambers. Oswald Chambers. <coughs> 
And it's called my utmost, U-T, most, utmost, my utmost, my best for his highest. My utmost for his highest by Oswald Chambers. Now listen to me, this is important. Get that in the modern language because he wrote this devotional a long time ago. So the writing, if you get the original devotional, it's going to have a lot of very flowery language in it that might be hard to understand. I remember in college, that's the one I had, and I'd have to read the devotion three or four different times. But now they've come out with one that puts it in modern language so we can understand it better. But Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest. As a matter of fact, I gave that devotional to my son for Christmas this year. And I, I asked him if he's reading it on a regular basis. And he tells me he is. So that's a good thing. Um, let, me, uh, let me just close here. Uh, the thing I, I want you guys, let me, let me just run through some things here really quick. I want to end this on the Word of God because... Uh, I've said really everything that I want you to hear from me as your teacher, and I want to once again encourage you, encourage you to read this on your own. Now on page 28, he talks about illumination, and I, this is important because this is where the Spirit of God that wrote the Bible illuminates the Bible, makes it understandable to you. This is so important. It's so important and it's so easy to miss because we've heard it so much. The Holy Ghost of God wrote the Bible. The Holy Spirit of God wrote the Bible. So if you believe that the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible through men the way we've talked about, then the same Holy Spirit, when you are reading the Bible, will turn a light on in you, illuminate, and help you understand the Scripture. So as you're reading, as you're going through that Bible I just recommended, as you're going through that devotional that I just recommended, as you're going through that, just, and I'll get to something in the Bible sometimes, and I just can't make it make sense, and, and, and I'll just say, Lord, I need you to teach me. I need you to teach me. And, and of course, I, I, I don't want to be lazy, so I'm going to do my research, and I've got some sources I go to to look what they said about it and, um, and all of that. But, but then I'm like, Lord, you teach me. You teach me. You illuminate my mind. Let me read the words of the author here on this. Not only did God reveal his word to human writers, he also superintended the entire process of writing of the text that eventually entered into the canon that became the Holy Bible. Having completed written revelation to humanity and finishing the process of inspiration in the production of these books, only one element remains as the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. The words of the printed page must penetrate our hearts. It must penetrate our hearts and minds uh, of the readers and listeners in every generation. Such, here it comes, such is the Spirit's divine role of providing illumination, understanding of the text. Whether done in a corporate gathering of thousands or in the seclusion of a Christian's private room with God, this surely ranks among the greatest works of the Holy Ghost in this present age is that we would read his book and he would speak to us and tell us what it means and burn it into our hearts, illuminating us. You ought to make that a part of your prayer. Lord, teach me. You teach me your word. Illuminate my mind. Help me understand it. I've got to tell you, I've been preaching before. I've been preaching before, and, and I love to do expository preaching. I love to go verse by verse, and I haven't done that the whole time I've been here, but I've done it quite a bit. <clears throat> but I've been preaching before, 
And in the middle of my sermon, I would be going through that scripture that I'd studied and studied and studied and had, had it ready and wanted to pray. And God would give me the meaning of a phrase or a word in the middle of my preaching that would allow me to preach it that I hadn't even understood it that way before. You've done that, haven't you? God will illuminate your mind while you're teaching, while you're preaching. Now, I will say that is very, very rare. And I think one of the reasons it's rare is because God don't want us to get lazy. He wants us to study. He wants us to do the, the diligent, the due diligence of our Bible study. But I think when you do your due diligence of Bible study and you dig in the Word of God and you try to get them gold nuggets out of there, I believe there are moments when you'll be witnessing to somebody or you'll be answering a Bible question somebody asks you and God will just illuminate you right there on the spot at that very moment. And you'll speak. I tell you, I've spoke before and, and y'all will hear me so I'll go, man, tape that. I don't even know why I said that or where that came from. Make sure that's on the tape. I want to go back and listen to that. That's a little humor that I use when I feel like God's done that sometimes. When God has said, I need you to say this right here. And maybe it was something I already knew, but I wasn't going to say it at that point. But while I'm preaching, God goes, say it now. Say it right there. This is the perfect place for it. And I don't hear those words. I don't hear those words. I'm not standing up here telling you I hear an audible voice from God so and go and say that right now. But the unction of the Holy Spirit in me, I know that needs to be said right there. And, and God will do that to you. I'm nobody special. I'm called to preach and I'm thankful and humbled by being called to preach. But every one of us are called to be a preacher in a sense. Every one of us. And God will illuminate your mind. Uh, let me read that last chapter or that last paragraph. Whether done in a corporate gathering of thousands or in a secluded uh, private room, this surely ranks among one of the greatest works of the Holy Spirit in our present age. Listen to this. He who prompted the original thought in the minds of the writers... Now today, guides the very choice of words to express their thoughts. Finally, here it comes, enlightens the minds of contemporary readers, that's us, to the point that they may potentially comprehend the same truth <clears throat> that was originally in the mind of the writer when he wrote it down. Glory to God. That's awesome. The reason, I'm telling you, the reason Farrell Hardison doesn't know more than he knows is because I haven't pursued God more. And the reason you don't know any more than you know is because we let other things come in our life and steal our time with God. I'm telling you, if you will set yourself Nobody has to tell me to brush my teeth in the morning. Nobody has to tell me uh, to make coffee and fix my coffee and put all my different ingredients. I do it. I just get right up and do it every morning. I do my coffee for it, brush my teeth. I just thought I'd mention that and tell you all what order I do that in. But I, I have my coffee. I brush my teeth. Nobody has to tell me to do that. I've never gone in in the middle of the day go, you know, I don't have my coffee today. I didn't, drink, I didn't even brush my teeth this morning. It's an automatic, and your devotional life ought to be like that with the Lord. And I'm going to preach, and I think I've said this too, but I'm going to say it again. You'll probably hear, hear me say it again. When you say you don't have time, all I say is get up 15 minutes earlier. Get up 15 minutes earlier. Get that coffee. I am so glad to report to y'all that God don't mind coffee with your Bible study. I just want to report that right here tonight that God is all right. Are y'all glad about that? That he's all right about you having, I'm so glad because I wouldn't be getting nothing out of my Bible because I've got, I've got hold of that coffee cup about as strong as I've got hold of that Bible and uh, I just have my coffee and my time with the Lord and if I really want to go deeper and I really want to do something different, I get up a little earlier. You know what, if, if I was going through a day and Brother Mac, Brother Larry called me and they said, Brother Farrell, we got a situation, we need to talk to you, we need to do it today, I'd make time, wouldn't I? I'd make time. You're probably sitting out there, where going, where you ain't been our preacher that long, I don't know where you'd make time or not. Yeah, I would, I would. I'd make time. You know, we do what we want to do. Amen? Y'all mighty quiet. Y'all out there? 
We do what we want to do. We do what we discipline ourselves to do. And, and here's the thing about prayer and Bible study. If you'll do it, and old Larry Lee said this 50 years ago. <laughs> Larry Lee said, it starts with discipline. And discipline turns into desire. What was that third one? Desire turns into something else. But that's what happens when you start, when you start disciplining yourself. You say, I've got to discipline myself and make sure I pray. Discipline myself, make sure I read my Bible. Because when I pray, I'm talking to God. When I'm reading my Bible, God's talking to me. That's a conversation. That's how me and God get close. So I'm going to make sure I have that time. All of a sudden, what you had to discipline yourself to do, now you begin to like it. You begin to enjoy it. You begin to say, I'm not missing my, my Bible study time. I'm not missing my prayer time. I may have to miss this or my, I may have to miss that, but I'm not missing my time with the Lord. You'll develop that kind of hunger and that kind of desire for it. And then he talks about the in, inerrancy of the scripture and the infallibility. And we've talked about that a little bit. And, and uh uh, and, and then the authoritative and sufficiency of uh, our, the, uh, the word of God is authoritative and sufficient. I could go into a lot of that, but the thing there is that the word of God is above all. Y'all know that. There's no word above God's word. There's no authority above God's authority. There's no law above God's law. And so... Um, he spends some time talking about that. And I love how he spends some time talking about Pentecostals. And he says Pentecostalism is historically an experiential movement, and it is. We experience God in a Pentecostal church, don't we? We cry, we shout, we, we have gifts of the Spirit operating. He says, however, the authority of Scripture must measure the validity of every experience we have. See, you can't, you can't have an experience and say, well, I don't know what the Bible says, but I'll tell you what happened to me. Well, what happened to you isn't nearly as important as what the Bible says. What the Bible says is the authority. Your experience is not the authority. And we Pentecostals are bad about that. We're bad about, I had an experience, you know, and, and all of this, and I know the Bible don't talk about that or doesn't give any illustrations of that, but that's what happened. You got to be very, very, very careful with that. You can get into error very, very quickly. There, he says here, there's no new truth. All that remains is the possibility of illumination or understanding of old truth. There's no new truth. You don't take away from the Bible. Amen? You don't what? Take away, you don't add to. That's right. All that remains is the possibility of God giving you more understanding. That's all that can be different about the Word of God is that you understand it better and that you understand it more. There's no adding to it, no taking away. Some modern day voices speak of the Bible as uh, the preceding word and then prophetic utterances. And this is where Pentecostals have lost their mind. This is where they've gone crazy with experience. And they'll, they'll have utterances and they'll have a preceding uh, word of God. I think I talked about this last time where people actually have blank pages in the back of their Bible when somebody utters a prophecy. They don't check to see if it goes with the Bible. They just add it to the Bible. There are people that do that. And that's what he's talking about here. He's saying this is error. It's right here in his book. This is a error. This is wrong. The canon is closed. The Bible is closed. The Bible cannot be added to. It's done. It's complete. It's done. It is closed. The message of, the God, of God that constitutes the Christian faith. And uh, this was that scripture in Jude 3, but don't put it up there, Jenny. It says, was once and for all delivered. Talking about the Bible. Once and for all. The word of God's been delivered. It's been given to the saints. That's it. That's it. So any preacher that, that you hear that talks about other books of the Bible and all of that, be very, very, very careful with that. Now, there are other books of the Bible mentioned in the Bible. 
but they are just historical records. There's one book, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut my uh, notes here because if I don't, I'm going to keep right on. <coughs> I, know, I heard some of y'all say, thank you, Jesus, under your breath. Listen, uh, there is a book, and I would add this book to my library too if I were you. Um, the, the Writings of Josephus. Now, the Writings of Josephus is not a book in the Bible, but it is a book of history that tells some other things that happen right during the Bible times. But it is not, it is not uh, uh, to be considered scripture. It is not to be considered infallible. It's like a, it's like a U.S. history. You had a book um, that you studied in school, U.S. history, and you had world history. And those were the classes I loved the most. I, most. I didn't know I was going to be a preacher then. I couldn't do a speck of math. Not one bit of math. Uh, there was people like Mac to take care of that. But I, I was a history guy. I loved history, made good grades in history. And again, didn't know I was going to be a preacher. I'll tell you all one more funny thing in high school that happened to me. I think it was my junior year. So there was a contest on writing a, um, write an essay. You could choose whatever top, topic you wanted to and write an essay. Well, I didn't know it. I, I, did, I had no idea. I was no outstanding student. Uh, man, if I came home with a report card full of C's, my mom and daddy were tickled to death. So, so um, I wrote an essay on the bombing of Hiroshima, the Hiroshima bombing or Hiroshima, however you say it. And I wrote a paper on that. And we're sitting there in General Assembly. It's the end of the year, and they're giving away the awards. I'm sitting there probably cutting up, probably not paying attention, probably talking or trying to get some girl's attention. And he said, and the other winner is Farrell Hardison. And I'm talking to somebody, and I'm like, what? <laughs> what? And I went up there and got this little plaque. I got second place. Well, you know what that was? I didn't know what it was then. But that was God saying, putting together a story, putting together a message, I'm going to give you that gift. Now, I didn't know I was going to be a preacher, but it was at that very moment that I realized I had a spiritual gift of putting words together. Now, I didn't get called before that for any award, nor since then for any award. But it was just God confirming that, that he was going to use me uh, in that way, and um, I don't know kind of why I went off on that story. Do y'all remember? Uh, but anyway, uh, that's how God God illuminates. He He's not going to add to the Word of God. Here's how I'll say it: He's not going to add to the Word of God, but He will add to your understanding of the Word of God. He can expand your understanding of the Word of God. And what I want you to leave here tonight with is the Word of God is enough. The Word of God is finished. The Word of God is done. The Word of God is truth. Don't let anybody talk you out of that. If there's any young people in here, teenagers listening to me, do not let some teacher at school, and I don't think we got a problem with that in our area, but don't let some teacher, don't let some now, I know you're going to run into this in college. Don't let them talk you out of the truth of God's Word. You, you believe God's word. God's word is true. The Bible says about itself that when everything else has been shaken, one thing will be standing, and it's the word of God. The word of God will still be standing when everything that's been shaken has been shaken. Amen? All right. So I believe the next chapter, I should have took a look before I... Um, um, came, but uh, I think the next chapter maybe is on what is salvation, having, having an understanding of salvation. Uh, there might be one more before that. I can't remember, but we'll get right on it the next, uh, the next time. All righty? Let's all stand together, would you? Let's come up here and uh, close in prayer. Mm. Now, we've come to church today. We've been to church this morning, and uh, we've come to church tonight. And now it's time to go out there. Now it's time to go out. 
So when we leave here tonight, you might go out and get a little bite to eat or something, and then you go home. But, it, but tomorrow we'll get up and go about our lives. You are God's ambassador. You are God's representative in the world. When you leave this sanctuary and you go out there, you're God's representative in this world. Be kind, be loving, be available, pay attention to the people that intersect with your life. If there's somebody uh, waiting on your table, here, here's a good thing I like to do. It, it's a little uncomfortable for some waiters and waitresses from time to time. But I'll be with a buddy of mine, or I might be by myself. I'm usually with somebody. And I'll say, uh, we're about to pray. Can we pray for you about anything? Anybody sick in your family? Or, you know, if they act stunned. And they'll, they'll, they'll stand there for a minute, and then you go, you know, my grandmother's sick. Well, we won't pray for her. What's her name? Well, her name is Mavis or whatever. And we'll say, we're going to pray for Miss Mavis. So, so when you see us over here with our head bowed, we're praying for your grandmother. And you leave that, and here's what will happen. It's happened to me so many times. They will then wait on you better, which I really like that. They will, and they will bring up things, and they'll ask you who you are. And they'll ask you things, and they'll say, and they'll say oh, and I was thinking about somebody else that I need you to pray for. And they'll tell you somebody else. You say, well, we sure will. We sure will. We'll pray for them. And that just opens a door. It just opens a door. You sow a seed there. Sow a seed. There's just little ways that you can let people know that you're one of God's kids. You're one of his ambassadors. Amen? Amen. And we'll pray for you if you'd like for us to pray for you tonight if you're not doing well.